On this episode of Just Seen It, we review the fairy tale adventure Jack the Giant Slayer. So the director here is Brian Singer. Brian Singer has directed pictures like the first two X-Men pictures, The Usual Suspect, Superman Returns. So he's an experienced director. He's got a long resume in Hollywood. The historical drama, Emperor. I'm told there will be 2,000 Imperial troops lining the road. The snipers could take us out at any point, General. The whole point of this investigation was not to see if he was guilty or not, but to find a way to completely absolve him of guilt, to keep him in place, to keep the communists out. We chat with Stephen Poster, president of the Cinematographers Guild. We work with the director, work with the script to tell the story visually. And we review the romantic drama, Safe Haven. But today with you, this is probably the first time that I've looked up. Colby Smulders does have good chemistry with Julianne Huff, though, and I think that brings more mileage out of her character because of it. All right here on Just Seen It. Jack and a young princess meet by chance. My father used to read that to me. I like a good adventure. I'm looking for an adventure of my own. But Jack's beanstalk accidentally opens up his world to giants. I lost. Mankind have returned. Our mission is to find and return the princess. Jack seeks to rescue the kidnapped princess and save his own world in Jack the Giant Slayer. Hi, I'm Salim. I'm Aaron. And I'm Sean. And today we're going to review the newest fairy tale adaptation from Hollywood, Jack the Giant Slayer. This one directed by Brian Singer. We've all just seen it. Mm -hmm. Who's going <laughs> to bury their magic beans first? I, I shall start. Now, there have been many fairy tale movies that come out in the past couple years. We have the Snow White movies. We have Alice in Wonderland. And the problem with those movies is there's not a lot of subject material to take from. There's a, it's a very short story, and they're trying to create it into a huge epic movie. And a lot of times, it, it, it falls short, especially in this film. It is true. This fairy tale resurgence has been happening a lot lately. But it's actually due to Bill Willingham, a, a comic book writer who wrote a series of comic books called Fables that started in 2002. He, of course, gets no credit for it, but he brought us these concepts like Once Upon a Time, like the new Snow Whites and the Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, and now Jack the Giant Slayer. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's just not a good movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just a, a very weak script from Christopher McQuarrie, who has written things like Valkyrie and The Usual Suspects, and then we also have Darren Lemke and Dan Studney, and... It's just flat. There's nothing mm -hmm. new and exciting about this picture. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's becoming a problem for Hollywood as far as I'm concerned. They just want to find any story they possibly can and adapt it into the next Lord of the Rings, really. They want to make a fantasy epic and appeal to as many audience members as possible. I mean, this is a children's fairy tale, but they've made a movie that's not for children. It's PG-13. It's not for adults. It's not even that violent. <laughs> it's supposed to be for the widest audience possible, but by doing so, they've made a movie that's really for no one at all. And we've seen many of these characters before in countless Disney movies and countless cartoons. We have the farm boy and the princess. We have the royal advisor who wants to take over the king. There's just so many things that we've seen before. Nothing is new. And I think what we really need to be able to dive into this, these films is something new, interesting, and exciting. Something a little bit dark. But yeah, they, character motivation would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. Plot would have been nice. I actually, I remember I was sitting with you and we, we said I could, we could almost feel the screenwriter trying to stretch things yeah. out as much as humanly possible to get to what they wanted to be the end. But there's little, there's no energy in the movie. The lines are not being delivered with any sort of gusto. No one seems to be having fun with what should be a fun picture. And, and that's in the story. It's also in the performances. You've got Nicholas Holt and Eleanor Tomlinson play the leads. They play Jack and Isabel, who Isabel's just basically added to the story, who's 
a female version of Jack, as far as I'm concerned. And she's obviously going to fall in love with Jack. Right. But their their romance is just some flirtatious looks back and forth, so we know that they have feelings for each other. They're all good actors, but the script gives them nothing to do. It doesn't make them have... It doesn't give them charismatic personalities. Ewan McGregor plays a knight, and he's just not funny. It was terrible. Ewan McGregor came off The Impossible, which was a very good movie and he had a very strong performance and he comes into this film and this is probably about the most useless character I can think of from his entire career. There's there's no importance to him at all. He's yeah. just a knight. Yeah, and then we have Stanley Tucci who we obviously know is a fantastic actor, mm -hmm. completely wasted. His character made no sense. I, I was perplexed. Why Stanley Tucci in this movie? His name was Roderick and he was an advisor to the king whose plan somehow involved stealing the crown that had been hidden for thousands of years and taking control of the giants and ruling Earth. But it just, he could have done it, you know, months ago. He knew where everything was. I don't understand why he needed Jack to be the one to plant the beans. It just... <sighs> yeah, when Stanley Tucci shows up and he's playing the villain, I thought, oh, this could be, this is fun. Stanley Tucci's a villain. I, I love that. Yeah. Nothing. Doesn't no. do anything. Well, th there's just nothing there for him. Nothing there. <laughs> I'm talking to giants at the moment. So the director here is Brian Singer. Brian Singer has directed pictures like the first two X-Men pictures, The Usual Suspects, Superman Returns. So he's an experienced director. He's got a long resume in Hollywood. It's unfortunate that he just he doesn't bring anything to the table that's interesting or unique to this picture. It's the script. The script is it's, it's very weak, and there's not a lot for Brian Singer to really play with. Of course, that's not taking off any responsibility from Brian Singer. Right. He should have been able to make this into an, an, an entertaining film. Brian Singer could give us something. This world of the giants is a forest. A floating forest. A floating, a floating forest, forest with small with a, sheep. With a couple of stone heads. Even if the script doesn't say anything, you could make that world anything that you want to, especially yeah. with today's technology, and it's a forest. Yeah, it, he had a blank slate to really create something fascinating in the, in the vein of something like Lord of the Rings, but having his own stamp on it. And, he, he failed in terms of that. Just that part of it. He's, he has creativity. You know he has it. It, it just didn't come out in, in this film. There's no mystery or awe or wonder to anything in the imagery here either. The, the characters will look at something and react to it as if nothing happened. A beanstalk sprouts from the ground, and they just go, oh, there's a beanstalk. Well, we better climb the beanstalk. And that's not to say that the production values are bad. They are well made. The visual effects aren't terrible, but they just don't help the script at all. The script mm -hmm. is way too weak. If you're being annoyed by a group of kids and you don't have anything else to show them, show them Jack the Giant Slayer. They might enjoy it. Stream it. Jack the Giant Slayer, when they climb the beanstalk, the air is quite thin, so is the plot. Skip it. This movie is a colossal waste of time. There are much better movies out there right now. Skip it. Well, it looks like our votes add up to a half ticket, which is a skip it for Jack the Giant Slayer. Mm -hmm. Cheers mm -hmm. to the fairy tale movies that are so great. General MacArthur must decide if Emperor Hirohito should stand as a war criminal. If they don't know they're licked by now, they will get the picture today. So he assigns General Fellers to investigate the Emperor's involvement in the war. We are the occupying power, but we must be seen as liberators, not conquerors. But the General seeks to find his own lost love in Emperor. Hi, I'm Leah. I'm Brenna. And I'm Aaron. And we're here today to discuss the new film starring Matthew Fox and Tommy Lee Jones, Emperor. We've all just seen it, and I decree that Leah will go first. Here we are, the Japanese have surrendered at the end of World War II, and the American military is in Japan and helping rebuild it. It's basically a investigative procedural to find out whether Emperor Hirohito is guilty of war crimes. And General Fellers has been given the charge to go out and find out whether he's guilty or innocent of these war crimes. So the screenplay is written by Vera Blasi, who gave us Woman on Top, and by David Klass, who also gave us Walking Tall. It's very pedestrian. It's one foot right in front of the other. There are no twists, there are no turns, and as a result, there's very little intrigue. I agree that this is a procedural, it's an investigative film. However, I also feel that they completely invalidate all of the investigation. Mm -hmm. When Fellers says, do this because I feel that it's the right thing to do. <laughs> no evidence, he doesn't use any yeah. evidence. Wait, is that a spoiler? Not yeah. really, I mean, it didn't go into kind any of. details. Well, it's kind of a spoiler. But yeah, he, he, everything is completely invalidated, 
uh, all the evidence he gathers is is pointless because he doesn't use any of it. And so I it feel informs that kind of... his decision. He he doesn't use oh, no, it. It's... He doesn't use it when he presents it to MacArthur, but he uses his findings to make and and form an opinion. On top of that, there's this love story that you could probably tell the whole movie without. The the entire love story is fabricated from the word friend that was read by a producer in the real General Feller's diary. So about she, a Japanese one. About it. No, it just said friend. So she's like friend. Oh, could this be a love story? <laughs> and made it a love story. <laughs> Every film will have historical inaccuracies, but uh, the issue here is that the historical inaccuracies in place here kind of make for an uninteresting story. Mm. Uh, the, the actual story would have been far more interesting because the whole point of this investigation was not to see if he was guilty or not, but to find a way to completely absolve him of guilt to keep him in place to keep the communists out. It's in the same wheelhouse as... Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy that we saw last year. Um, and even if you go back a few more years to something like Courage Under Fire, where you've got Denzel Washington's character has to go and either exonerate or, you know, basically condemn um, Meg Ryan's character. Was she a coward or was she courageous? So, right. so we this is the only way we get to know this character, really. And the same thing kind of happens here in Emperor, where the only way we really get to learn about the emperor, Emperor Hir Hirohito, is by what other people say about him. It just doesn't dig deep enough. It's really not, it doesn't get interesting enough. And they, they really, unfortunately, have a lot of the Japanese characters speak in these platitudes. And we, the Japanese people, are this way. And you will never understand the Jap Japanese people that way. And I, I don't know. I just, I, I just don't know that people actually speak that way about themselves. I guess I liked themselves. that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I liked that they showed the cultural differences mm -hmm. between the two but they talked about a lot of yeah, the that's true. instead of really kind of giving us action. I mean, I felt and it plot too. elements that would demonstrate that. So we have Matthew Fox playing our lead of General Fellers, and he acts with conviction and believability in certain scenes. I would say that the romantic scenes don't work as well, but oh, yeah. he brings the suspense, he brings anger, and I don't see Matthew Fox, I see General Fellers. He's a serviceable actor. I believe him. Um, but there's just something that's missing, and I have a hard time getting behind him as somebody who can actually carry an entire film. On top of that, we have Time Lee Jones, who played General Douglas MacArthur, and he was so much fun to watch being this general. Now, let's show them some good old-fashioned American swagger. I could see his selfishness, and then at other times I could see his compassion. And I really enjoy Tommy Lee Jones. I think he's done such a great job in every role for the past 10 or so years. He's super strong. I have to say that he is quite the master, and it wasn't until the climactic scene with him where he toned it down and we saw a little nuance that I went... God, that guy is good. Yeah. <laughs> He's really good at what he does. And Aya is played by Eriko Hatsune. Her character didn't have much to her. Her point of existing was to be the love interest because they felt they needed a love story. Right. Yeah. I felt she did a good job with what she had. It is a little hard to make the difference between her acting and the writing because the writing is so subpar. So it's time to talk about the director, Peter Weber. He's worked on The Girl with the Pearl Earring. I don't really feel his hand in this picture, but I think that it's very is, light touch. Yeah, this but it's guy. still very good. I think the the thing that shines through the most are the production values and how depressing looking and yet incredible looking <laughs> post World War II Japan looks. There's a lot of CGI. There are occasional artistic flourishes mm -hmm. that Weber does, like when they're talking about the Emperor early on in the film. You never see his face, and you see him in shadow, and there's lots right. of quick cutting and interesting lighting. Since the love story is told in flashback, the flashback is treated differently. Mm -hmm. it's, it's filmed differently. It's brighter, there's more colors, it's more vivid. And I also felt that that was kind of a good touch and able to separate the sort of bleak present from the pretty past. Emperor is very interesting for the historical elements, but it really fails to reach crowning heights. So I say stream it. So we've seen this love story before, but we haven't seen this political story before. The love story detracts, it doesn't ruin. I say stream it. Emperor is a well-made film about a piece of history that I actually didn't know anything about. The love story is pretty cheesy, but it doesn't ruin it, so I'm also going to give it a stream it. Cheers. All right. Yeah, I got some new clothes. Perhaps a new groove? Oh. This week we actually have two DVD picks. One, a great movie, and the other, a great TV show. For the movie, it can only be the latest outing from 007 starring Daniel Craig, Skyfall. Country, England. Gun, shot. Agent, provocateur. Murder, 
employment. Skyfall. When Leah, Sean, and David reviewed it last fall, they gave it a commanding see it. For the TV show, it's one of my favorites, Game of Thrones, the complete second season. Power resides where men believe it resides. It's a trick, a shadow on the wall. Sometimes I wonder if this is the price for what we've done. Season 3 has already wrapped production, with the first episode airing on March 31st, so now's your chance to catch up on the HBO show that everybody's been talking about. So there you have it, a great movie and a great TV show, all for your home theater enjoyment. Hi, I'm David. I'm Sean. And I'm Steven. We're very pleased today to be joined by Steven Poster, who's the president of the International Cinematographer Guild Local 600. Thank you for being here, Steven. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. What is the basic purpose of the Guild? We are a trade union, plain and simple. We have cinematographers, we have camera operators, we have camera assistants, we have still photographers. We have over 7,000 members across the country. And uh, the purpose is, as, as any labor union, is to protect the worker, to provide uh, benefits for the worker, to negotiate with the, uh, with the companies, and, uh, uh, which we do every three years to uh, come up with our new contracts, and to basically give people a family to work within. So you've worked on Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Blade Runner, and then as a cinematographer. As director of photography, as second unit director of photography on Close Encounters and additional photography on Blade Runner. And then movies like Donnie Darko with Richard Kelly. Absolutely. Someone to Watch Over Me with Ridley Scott. Thank uh, you. Life Stinks with Mel Brooks. Absolutely. <laughs> and Mel's still a friend. But wait a minute, you forgot one of the most important ones. I'm sure I, I forgot. Strange many. Brew. Strange Brew. <laughs> Anything in particular that really... Put your focus on cinematography? I got involved with, cin with cinematography uh, when I was 14. Wow. I got involved with photography when I was about 10. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 14, uh, living in the suburbs of Chicago, an old Jaguar drove up and this guy got out and he had a beard and a cap and smoking a pipe and he had a light meter on his belt. And I saw that and I ran out of the house and I said, hi, my name is Steve, I live next door. What kind of light meter is that? And he said, son, we'll have a lot of time to talk about that. I'm building a house next door to you. And who was that? Maury Blackman was uh, a CBS newsreel cameraman, and he wow. owned the 16-millimeter news lab in Chicago. The day I met him, I thought he was the coolest human being I'd ever met. <laughs> and I said, I want to be him. And, uh, of course, I smoked a pipe. I had a beard. <laughs> I you know, did everything I could did to be him. Kingdom. What would be the advice you would give to someone just starting out in the business as a cinematographer? It's a crowded market. Everybody wants to do it. Everybody thinks they can do it because you get a digital camera and you push the button and you can make images, you know, even yeah. on your cell phone. What you need to do is you need to persevere. You need to shoot anything that moves and get involved with everything that you can, every free production, uh, work in the crew, work your way up, create a community. And I would say this not only to cinematographers, I'd say this to anybody wanting to get into the film business. Say yes. Say yes to <laughs> all of it and do what you can to keep your momentum up and create that community so that people start calling you right. to do the job. With digital imaging, digital capture, how will cinematographers adapt to retain control of the image? We're trying to, to simplify that process, and, and part of it has to do with the technologies that are developing. Technologies are simplifying all the time, and we find that the work that was done by the front-end post houses and laboratories now can be done right on the set at a great savings. We're actually gaining more control as cinematographers, as, as uh, gatekeepers of the quality of the image, because now we can do our coloring on the set. Uh, before dailies uh, go out to anybody. So they're getting the intent of the director of photography. The technology has gotten so good that we are able to do the coloring, uh, create the dailies, and protect the image. 
technology has changed to the point where this simple workflow that we had for over a hundred years doesn't, doesn't exist it. anymore. Yeah, it's and yeah. we had to we had to take control as cinematographers and develop our own techniques and technologies and best protocols. How difficult a process is it to get into the union? You know, it's much easier than most people think, and we're very welcoming. I talk to uh, uh, young workers all the time about how to get in, and in fact, our our staff counsels people on how to do that. Uh, Mathematically, it's simple. You need to get 100 days within three years in your category or in classification, non-union, or 30 days union, which can happen if a show gets organized. So if a non-union show gets organized and there's 30 days of work within that, you're a member. How would you best describe the role that you play on a film or on a TV show? We are the guardians of the image, as I said before, and uh, our role is kind of as the set magicians. We work with the director, work with the script to tell the story visually. We interpret the story visually. We also create the way the images are brought to the medium that you're shooting on and uh, then controlled through the process of uh, uh, getting it to the editorial room. So what's next for you and what's next for the Guild? The most important thing for the Guild right now is to make sure that our members are the best at what they do. We have a very aggressive training program. We have the most aggressive training program in the industry. We train them to understand what the new technologies are, how to work with them, and how to best protect the image. Well, on behalf of the cast and crew of Just Seen It, I'd like to thank you for joining us here today. It's been very illuminating. And as we like to finish, cheers. Cheers. As I say, l'chaim. L'chaim. To escape a mysterious past, Katie moves to a small southern town. Why Southport? And I was just looking for a change. There, she falls for Alex, a widower, raising two children. But today with you, this is probably the first time that I've looked up. It's a perfect day. But their love is threatened when Katie's secret comes back to haunt her in Safe Haven. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm Aaron. And I'm Brenna, and we're here to talk about the new Nicholas Sparks adaptation, Safe Haven. We've all just seen it. Guys, is it a haven? Safe Haven is about a girl named Katie who has to escape Boston because of some sort of tragedy that we're not quite privy to. She dyes her hair, cuts it, and moves off to a small town in North Carolina. A safe haven. (laughs) That has become her safe haven. And there, of course, she starts to live amongst the people and falls in love, but then her past comes back to haunt her. Script was by Leslie Boehm and Dana Stevens. Leslie Boehm is famous for Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream, Dream Child. Child. Is that really what famous True. for? Or well, that you're making fun of him? I see <laughs> your name, I think, Dream Child. <laughs> and Dana Stevens did uh, City of Angels. So the problem with the script is actually the source material by Nicholas Sparks. Uh, it's a lot of surface emotions. There's no depth to it at all. It's really easy to follow. It's really easy to figure out until the weird ending. The film follows a very basic formula that you've seen in other Nicholas Sparks adaptations. The movie has two characters. One of them has a secret. You spend the majority of the movie watching them fall in love, and then the third act has drama ensuing. There's a checklist that you see in these types of romantic dramas that includes cute kid characters, a director who's handled romantic dramas before, touching scenery, the love scenes, etc. The problems here are with the script, and the problems with the script come from the source material because all of the problems with the film are things that are integral to the plot that you really couldn't take out of the script. However, I did find that the relationship between Kate and Alex, it was legitimate. It was like an actual romance. Oh, they have good chemistry. Yeah. So that would be Julianne Hough and Josh Duhamel. Julianne Hough is incredibly strong here. I think with the right roles, she could actually become the next Meg Ryan. Along with the Katie and Alex story, we have some other subplots. We have the story of this cop who's trying to find Katie. She's wanted for murder. There's an APB out for her. And then we also have uh, the next door neighbor friend character, which is Joe, played by Kobe Smulders. Unfortunately, these other subplots, while they're, again, integral to the plot, they're problematic. They're distracting. They're really problematic. Yeah, they're distracting or they're, they're even more basic than the love story between Katie and Alex, <laughs> which I didn't think was possible. Look, I, I, I moved out here, same reason as you, I think, to get some peace and quiet. So I, I get it if you just... Yeah, I like the fact that I can hear myself think. I mean, isn't it so nice to be away from all that noise and that chatter? The Joe character, Kobe Smulders' character, is half the time I'm sitting there going, 
Why are you here? Right. You serve no purpose. This is really awkward. Colby Smulders does have good chemistry with Julianne Huff, though, and I think that brings more mileage out of her character because of it. Colby Smulders' performance was, was good. Everybody's performance in this was good. And that's pretty much the saving point of this film. Julianne Huff is amazing as, as this lady. She's, she's really good. She's charismatic and she's sweet and she's at her strongest in the romantic scenes when she's kissing and cuddling and giggling and it's adorable to watch her. Your walls need a little bit. Oh my god! <laughs> Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> when they flash back to the problems she was having at home, there's, there's a definitive difference between the characters and then even her evolution is actually really nicely played. Josh Duhamel in this movie brings the same kind of charisma and energy that he's brought to his other romantic leading man roles like When in Rome or Life as We Know It. Demel did have some problem with the dramatic side of his character though. There were scenes where it felt like he was trying to cry and couldn't do that so he just did this. Yeah. Mm. He just covered his face instead. And finally, we have the cop character, played by David Lyons, whose entire role is weakened by the way that the film is shot. Because he's got this character, yeah. he's a drunk, he's an alcoholic, he's violent, he's angry. His performance is believable. He's very believable as this crazy, bad cop. But because he's intercut with these really happy scenes and suddenly it's dark, the transitions are comical. It completely detracts from his performance and makes him appear comical, even though he's doing a good job in this role. So it was directed by Lars Hallstrom. He's done What's Eating Gilbert Grape, he's done Chocolat, he's done Cider House Rolls, he's also done another Nicholas Sparks movie, Dear John. Dear John. And it feels like he's a bit on autopilot here. Los Alstom's direction is pretty, but it's kind of generic. I do think that his pacing was pretty good, though, and I wasn't really ever bored. Really? I thought that it moved really slowly. There was actually a point where I looked at my watch in the theater. It was kind of a loungy movie, but I didn't, I wasn't bored with it. Like, I wasn't like, oh, I want to get out of here. But it was the ending. It just, by the time I got to that, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It's not the movie that I necessarily racing out to see, but I understand the audience that wants to see a movie like yes. Safe Haven. And for the most part, I do think the performances are strong enough, and I think the direction, it does enough to bring justice to these characters and to what we're getting to see and to how the story is playing out regardless of the story's problems. And then, yes, you, you do get to the ending, and it becomes kind of an issue because you're... You're hitting certain story beats that are... You didn't, one you didn't prepare really, for them. Yeah, you didn't prepare for them. You don't really need them. I don't know if it... You didn't need them. And that's the thing is I thought I was actually going to cry. But then suddenly the ending happens and you just kind of get drawn out of it. And you're like, what the heck is going on? One too many rugs are pulled. And yeah, yeah you get the kind of expected ending. Then you get a bonus ending. And you're like, oh, <laughs> this is also part of this movie. When the credits rolled, I literally went, What? I was going to give this to see it for the fans of this type of genre and because I really like Julianne Huff's performance, but the ridiculous ending just blew it for me. So I say stream it. Safe Haven's not my kind of movie per se, but I, despite its simplicity, I do recognize that there's an audience for this type of movie, so I'm going to say stream it. Films of this genre can be done well and can be enjoyed by fans and non-fans alike. This is not one of those films, so I say stream it. Well, our votes add up to one and a half tickets, so that's a stream it for Safe Haven. Cheers. Cheers. To finding places to hide. In North Carolina. On our next episode, we review the action thriller Snitch, starring The Rock himself, Dwayne Johnson. Bless Me Ultima, based on the best-selling novel by Rudolfo Anaya. And the new mystery Stoker, from director Chan Wook Park, and starring Mia Wasikowska and Nicole Kidman. Thanks for watching, and see you next week.